The D-Day dispatches continue at midnight. First on ITV1, Alistair Stewart is your host for Who Wants to Be a London Mayor? And a very warm welcome to ITV's London studios on the South Bank. It's been four years since we voted for a London mayor for the first time. Next Thursday, we choose who will be London's next mayor. But who do you think it should be? Well, tonight, we put three leading candidates into the hot seat. Would you please welcome, first of all, for the Conservative Party, Steve Norris. <laughs> for the Liberal Democrats, Simon Hughes. And our current mayor, elected as an independent, but now back with Labour, Ken Livingstone. <laughs> a very warm welcome to you all, and let's hope it's a good, clean, lively contest. Thank you for joining us this evening. Please would you also welcome our three panellists who have the enviable task of grilling the candidates. Eve Pollard was born and bred in London. She was editor of the Sunday Mirror, where she launched their magazine section, and she edited the Sunday Express. She also launched Elle magazine in the United States. Eve is a regular contributor on national television and lives in northwest London with her family. Eve Pollard! Nick Ferrari presents a breakfast show on LBC and regularly appears on national television, reviewing the major news stories of the day. He's also been the deputy editor of The Mirror. Nick lives with his family in Blackheath. Nick Ferrari. <laughs> Christina Adone, whose career in journalism began on the Catholic Herald, is now deputy editor of The New Statesman. Well known to TV and radio audiences, Christina also has a regular column in The Observer. She lives in Chelsea. Christina Adone. <laughs> so, who wants to be a London mayor? The rules of this deadly serious game are quite simple. Each of our three panellists have chosen to quiz two candidates. They have three minutes, no more and no less, with each candidate who will take their turn in the hot seat. We also have an audience here, including a few well-known faces, who will also get a chance, I hope, to put their questions to Messrs Livingston, Hughes and Norris after the panellists have finished with them. And you can also hear this programme on LBC Radio. So, without further delay, would you please welcome Steve Norris to the hot seat. <laughs> Steve Norris is an ex-Tory MP and Transport Minister. He's been telling voters that he's going to scrap the congestion charge, wants to take control in the appointment of the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, and should he become mayor, he's pledged to give up the chairmanship of the railway engineering company, Jarvis. And we turn first of all to Christina Adone. Your three minutes with Steve Norris start now. Steve. You're still on the payroll of Jarvis, the company implicated in the Potter's Bar rail crash that killed seven Londoners. How can you have anything to do with a company that has blood on its hands? Well, the important thing is... <laughs> the, the important thing is that what you have to have in this city are people who can actually manage uh, a city as complex as London. Uh, actually, to be fair, I mean, apart from the fact that I don't see there being any conflict in that, it is actually, it has been a hallmark of the last four years that we might have had a lot of politics, but we haven't actually seen a lot of progress in delivering either a safer city or a city in which it's easy to get around. And actually what the city needs is less politics. It needs a lot more management. It needs managing in the way that, you know, people have to understand is not just a matter of sitting in the office and thinking of a good idea. You have Steve, to Steve, 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 wait, wait, wait. I am, I am listening to political speak here. Where's the answer to my question? How I, can you have anything to do with a company obvious. that has blood in its hands? Perfectly obvious. I mean, if, if your uh, 
proposition is that the only people you want to be a candidate for mayor are those who've never held a serious job, uh, then what you find yourself saying is that uh, you want more of those political animals that we see far too many of at the moment who are people who've never actually been involved in any serious business in their lives. Steve, Simple as that. Steve, I think that what we would like to see is commitment from a candidate who wants to be mayor. That's it. And I want you to say, look, London matters more to me than my wallet. Of course, and that's why I'm standing. That's the whole point. I mean, you really should understand this, because those of us who could quite easily earn a huge amount more in the private sector, if we chose to, who don't have to do programmes like this, don't have to go through the process, nonetheless do, because the alternative is that you find yourself electing people who have actually no experience of what it's like in the real world running substantial organisations. And I think it's important that one does that. And a great many people actually, I think, you know, understand that as well. And, right, and it's Steve, important Steve, to get that let's, straight. Let's talk about something else. You want to drop the congestion charge, and yeah. you've told me that you run, you've run companies, you're a business candidate here. Does it make good business sense for us... 30 seconds to you both. ..for us to drop all that expensive infrastructure that cost us millions to well, introduce the congestion charge. You'll forgive charge. me for saying that it wasn't me who spent the money. For that, you have to turn no, to but, the outgoing... But let's say you're mayor. You what do you do with the those outgoing millions, mayor for the cost? millions of expensive Oh, yes. Equipment. Anybody who understands the first thing about business would know that the cure is far worse than the disease. You can't not afford to scrap it. I mean, that scheme is costing, in cash, literally hundreds of millions of pounds a year for small shopkeepers, <laughs> restaurants... There, I can't have to stop it. To. Christina... And Mr Norris, thank you both very much indeed. Eve Pollard, your three minutes start now. Uh, Steve, you say if you're elected, you would like to control who will be the next uh, London Metropolitan Commissioner of Police. Mm. How is that going to help London? Uh, I think it's... I don't happen to think it's the most critical thing that the Mayor's got to do, but how you help London is because the biggest issue in this city, if you actually talk to people who live in it, isn't actually how quick it takes you to do your commuting journey. It's actually people not feeling safe in the city they live in. You know, when you actually talk to real people, they tell you all the time that when they listen to the sort of announcements you get far too often from the Metropolitan Police and, I have to say, from the Mayor, telling us that crime's on the way down, telling us that, you know, we're on top of the job, and you then realise that underneath that is the fact that actually not only is violent crime on the Met's own figures up 20% over four years, but that actually in your own community, nobody you talk to actually feels safe. But That's why it's personal to me. You know, talking about stuff Christina's saying, let me make it absolutely clear. To me, living in the city, I happen to live in Lambeth, but you could all live almost anywhere, I want this to be a safer city. But how and I don't think we're getting that from the Metropolitan Police How are police you now. choosing the, the, the top man change that? And, and... Oh, I think that's a different issue to be honest, because that's simply about who ought to be able to have the final say. And I just happen to think that whether it's Ken Livingston or me, the person who's elected will be the person who ought to have that final say. But you'll say. have to Not go to Parliament secretary. to ask them to do that. They're yeah, not going to you, are they? No doubt. Well, I don't see why not. It's a perfectly legitimate proposition. But in New York, and you talk about zero tolerance a lot, uh, Trelawney has some control over the courts. You have no control over the courts at all. Does that mean that we shouldn't try? Does that mean you don't do anything? I mean, isn't the real problem in this city that an awful lot of people just say, oh, well, rising crime's the price you pay for living in a big city? I don't think that's acceptable. But does this don't mean remember anything? Remember that the mayor I mean... actually... Yes, it means a lot. The mayor actually controls the budget of the Metropolitan Police, nearly £3 billion. The mayor appoints half the Metropolitan Police Authority. And most important of all, the mayor's the one person who can speak for the people in this city who, at the moment, don't find their voice being heard. At the top of the office. Nobody has any complaints with officers on the ground, but what we want to know is, why is it, for example, when I go to Barkingside, I meet a guy who says, when I wanted the police, they told me, just hire some private security. We've got much more serious things to do. That's not acceptable. This is a city where I ring the average suburban police station. But the, It'll but take Parliament me half an hour to get through. That's not acceptable. It's never going to change 30 those seconds, rules. both of you. Now, let's argument, talk about people at the bottom. But your argument seems to be, Eve, that if Parliament won't change the rules, you just give up. If that had happened, I can't think of any significant development in our democracy that would ever have happened. You have to force ahead when you know you're right and you have to just make the point this but, city deserves better than it's getting but what about people at the bottom we're talking
talking about affordable housing, and you're going to have less. You're going to cut that no, down. Not at all. On the contrary. 35%. On the contrary, I'm going to get more. If you actually look at the record for all the rhetoric about high figures, the reality is less has been delivered <laughs> over the last couple of years. Full stop there, Mr. Norris. Eve Pollard, thank you both very much indeed. Let's have some, some questions then from the audience. I'm going to start over there with Max Clifford. Your question to Mr Norris, Max. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's fair, Sorry, Steve, Max. to say that more and more people are more and more frightened, um, feeling more and more insecure, but in reality, what can you do about it? What you have to do, Max, is first of all not try and do the Commissioner's job, but what you do have to do is to represent the people who so far haven't had a voice right at the top of the office. Uh, at the top of the office, you know, the, just taking the example I was making, uh, I met a chap just the other day who bought a McDonald's franchise right next door to a police station because he thought, well, at least it'll be safe. When he had problems with just half a dozen yobs, they were just kids, um, he, he rang up, he said, look, you don't have to come out, just look through the window, you can see the problem I've got. They said, sorry, we've got more serious things to do, you go and hire a bit of private security. Now, you know, to me, that is so unacceptable and somebody has to say it. Somebody has to say, you've got your priorities wrong. How is it that we've now got more police officers in this city than at any time in our history, and we've certainly paid the bill for them, and yet half the police stations in London are either closed or open nine till five, as if crime happened nine till five. We're entitled to say, at the top of the office, come on, that's not good enough. Harriet Scott's question. I want to talk about zero tolerance. And you talk about it, but what is actually your definition of it and how do you hope to enforce it? And is it going to be through community support police officers who, by my understanding, have no more authority than me to make citizens arrest? How is that going to make me feel safe on the street? Yeah, let's go back to that example I just gave, because what zero tolerance means, it's a much misunderstood expression, is actually that you don't... You know, believe, people's perceptions of safety are not actually governed by things like murder and bank robbery. They're governed by all of that urban incivility, the antisocial behaviour, the graffiti, the vandalism, the public drunkenness, the public urination, all of that sort of behaviour which gives every community an edge. And the point is that on Giuliani's definition, you would actually get the police out for half a dozen yobs in Barkingside. Why? Because actually they're the ones who are also making the whole of that town centre a misery on a Friday and a Saturday night. So how are you because do it? when you tackle that, well, it's very simple. It's about deploying the officers you've got much more effectively and much more openly than we've done in the past. At the moment, we've got an average, Harriet, of 600 officers in every single borough in London. An average. We've got 30,000 of them now on the payroll. And if you ask how many are out on the street tonight, uh, any borough in London, I doubt it's more than a dozen. Brian it's about Turner, deployment. Restaurant. My question, sir, is about your policy on non-smoking in public places. At the moment, the uh, British Hospitality Association has a plan that will lead to 80% ban in the year 2007. Do you agree with that route? And yeah, if good not, enough for we me. look for total, uh, total ban, and if so, when? No, that's good enough for me. I, I personally hate the idea of legislation, provided you can satisfy me that people who are bar staff, for example, are restaurant staff, who ought not to be forced to breathe smoke if they don't want to, can be provided for, and all the evidence is that they can. I'd much sooner have voluntary enforcement than any kind of ban by government. So will you talk to our associations to oh, help delighted. that happen? Delighted. Thank I think you. we're winning that battle anyway, to be honest with you, Brian, but I personally can't stand smoke, and if I find a smoky place, I won't go there, I won't give them my money. Just swing slightly round to your right over to this side. Let's have a couple of questions from this side of the audience. My little boy was mugged on his first day mm. to secondary school, which is a bit of an extraordinary phenomenon. What I'm concerned about is that there's a knee-jerk reaction about, well, we've got to get more police onto the streets, whereas, in fact, it goes back to providing for youth. What is your long-term strategy for changing a paradigm shift yeah. towards looking after our Mr. young Norris. people and recognising right, them? Right, let me tell you, it's very straightforward. We spend £2.7 billion on the Metropolitan Police each year and we spend about £20 million across the city in youth intervention, in giving young people something positive to do. I've said I want to double that every year in the next four years. Because, actually, if you can catch a young person before they're out of their teens and make sure that they don't get a criminal record, not only have they saved society a lot of damage, they've actually bought themselves something very precious. They're very unlikely ever after that to get a criminal record. Practice if you don't, what? then By you have a problem. What? One final question from the lady there in green, third row back. Mr Norris, I hear, I read about you criticising everybody and I know <laughs> that the, the Christian People's Alliance Party want to bring values back into society and not yeah. politics. Yeah. What values would you bring to London? 
London. I, I think, actually, far from being critical of people, I think there's a huge amount that's wonderful about this city. That's why most of us actually stay in it. But you want to sack the Metropolitan Police... Well, you've asked the question, let him answer. All I say about this job is it's not about politics. It's about making people feel safer, be able to get around the city more easily, give people job opportunities in the city that's got the worst unemployment rate of any region of the United Kingdom, make it a city more Londoners are actually positively proud of than they are at present. Mr. It could Norris, be so much better. Thank you very much indeed. Audience, thank you for your questions and panel too. <laughs> Stay with us because right after this short break, we'll be having Simon Hughes for the Liberal Democrats in the hot seat. Stay with us. <laughs> In America, if you hit a hole in one, you're expected to buy everyone a drink. However, in Japan, it's traditional to buy your playing partners expensive gifts. <laughs> Yeah, same hole. At HSBC, we never underestimate the importance of local knowledge. <laughs> HSBC, the world's local bank. The new Citroen C2 HDI with unbeatable fuel efficiency from 6495. Now with cash injection system. The Citroen C3 with four star Euro end cap safety rating from 6995. Money bags fitted as standard. Citroen, innovators in value. Chicken Provençal from the new Sheba Creation Range. Sheba in a world of its own. The President used only the Emmental from the heart of the wheel, giving you only the sweet, nutty cheese that's just irresistible. I'm Andrew Taylor, Chairman of McDonald's UK. I've worked here for 25 years and know how seriously we take our food. But don't take my word for it. On the 16th of June, we're inviting you behind the scenes to see for yourself. Just call this number to book. We look forward to seeing you. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. I'm loving it. One wonder is treble ear. For a fast and friendly directory inquiry service, call 118-888, the only number you need. That's 118-888. Reactions lenses react to light. So whatever you're doing, you only need one pair of glasses instead of two. And now at Specsavers, Reactions lenses are free. Should you have gone to Specsavers? Welcome back to the hottest debate in town. Who wants to be a London mayor? Straight on with it. And next into the hot seat, would you please welcome for the Lib Dems, Simon Hughes. <laughs> Simon is a qualified lawyer, has been MP for Bermondsey since 1983, 
He believes the congestion charge should stay, but needs tweaking. He proposes to pedestrianise Oxford Street and to close large sections of the tube network for periods of up to ten days for urgent engineering improvements. On crime, he wants to extend visible policing with teams of eight police officers and community officers in every London ward. Nick Ferrari, your three minutes with Simon Hughes. Start now. Good evening, Mr Hughes. Good evening, Nick. I'm hearing mixed messages concerning you and the congestion charge. On the one hand, you say that you're in favour, but it needs radical a radical tweaking. Could you sum up in uh, one brief sentence, please, exactly what you plan? I would keep it in the present zone, not extend it westwards, and make it easier to use for the driver and more helpful to the businesses in the centre of London. How will it be easier for the driver? You'd be able to pay in advance, you'd be able to pay up the end the following day so you don't get a 40 quid fine if you forget not illegally, just forget. And for the businesses, it would stop at five so that the early evening business wouldn't be badly well, affected. Well, you've just moved the rush hour then, Mr Hughes, to a different time. No, it's people coming in, Nick, you need to stop. The early the people evening... also need to get away. True, but the early evening trade is very important. The late night shopping is important. The people who would have a meal before the cinema, before the theatre, and they've said to us, look, we're happy with the congestion charge, but you've got to stop it earlier in the day, and I'd do that. Mr Hughes, another plank of your uh, policy is to uh, attack the problems of London's crime, which we've heard much about. You have a lot of confidence in the community support officers. How do they work? No, they're ancillary, the primary confidence. Yes. Nick, the primary confidence is in the police. Yes, but you're also keen to bring in community support well, officers. Well, no, the police have the key role. They're the people I ha would have in all of the wards of all of the boroughs leading sergeant, four-year contract, making sure that they reported back every quarter. The community support officers are simply the backup people. They will deal with the local crime, the minor crime, the graffiti, the vandalism. How will they do that? They're unable to arrest and they have to retreat if the situation gets violent. What can they achieve? They can hold people for half an hour, Nick, as you probably know. Hold people for half an hour? They can hold people for half an hour. Well, what, what good is that? No their, no, their job, Nick, is to deal with the parks where somebody might have set light to the park bench, the telephone kiosk that's been well, vandalised. I doubt that many people in the capital are concerned about park well, benches. More well, people are concerned about no, children Nick, you being asked, hugged. No, 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 Nick, like you asked me about about community support officers, the key battle is on crime. That's where you've got to get the police out. I have police at the tube station entrances in the mornings, at the railway station entrances. I want the police where the people are, not the people looking for where the police might be. And that's Mr Hughes, what experience do you have of ever having run anything? Until... <laughs> perfectly good question. Before, before, I was, before I was elected, before I was elected, I prosecuted for the police as a lawyer in all London courts. Responsible job every day in all the courts of London. Since I've been in Parliament, I hope I've helped turn Southwark round to a borough which won a Beacon Award for community safety. Not directly, last... not directly, but indirectly. <laughs> and, la no... In the, the last... Let me answer the, the, the last the election, the last you four... came a distant fourth, Mr Hughes. And Why would you do any better this time? Because when I stood in Bermondsey, we came from third to first in the last week. When we stood in Brent last year, we came from third to first in the last week and smashed the Tories, and we'll do it again this time. Why is your leader, Charles Kennedy... <laughs> Why has your leader, Charles Kennedy, called your campaign team in? He hasn't called the campaign team. That was an a, evening standard are lying. It was an inaccurate story. It came from one paper. Is he happy with your campaign? He is, and he'll be with me again tomorrow, as he's been every week in the campaign, and we talk regularly. We're a united <laughs> team, thank you. Thank you, Mr Hughes. Christina Adone, your three minutes with Simon Hughes start now. Mr Hughes. Christina, good evening. Your most headline-grabbing initiative so far has been to pedestrianise Oxford Street, or to propose to pedestrianise Oxford Street. It sounds great. But how will it affect Londoners on a practical level? To be fair, you say it's the most headline-grabbing. I wouldn't have put that. It's one of the proposals to make London easier. How would it affect Londoners? It would allow the most successful and important retail street to be a place that people have a good experience of. It would allow people to come by cab or bus to the edge of the street and eventually, I hope, by tram along the street. It would make it a really pleasant and successful shopping experience and help the West End to hold on to business, not lose it. What about underground? You propose to have the essential maintenance work on the tube to be carried out, not overnight and over the weekend, as we do now, but all in one go. Is that really practical? I've talked to the people you'd expect that I would have done that. They say they need a good period of time to get the work done. What are the two complaints people make? It's congested in the morning. I'd have cheaper fares for people coming in earlier. Yes, but and, does that and, mean that those of us who travel peak time have to subsidise no, the no, early no, birds? No, 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 you'd pay the same fare as now. So where fare. does the money come from? Last year, amazingly, Transport for London underspent by over £40 million. To do that would cost about £20 million. So this wonderful regime, which has built up a deficit of nearly a billion, actually underspent in last year. But to answer your other question, 
rather than trying to get a few hours maintenance in the middle of the night, no sooner have you got to work, you have to pack up. If you close line by line over the summer for about 10 days, when the schools are on holiday, when people aren't working, then you have a chance to get a lot of... When, Sorry, no, when fewer Hughes. people When fewer people are working, Christine. When fewer Hughes, people. do you remember last year when the central line had that derailed? No, but that was for weeks. The whole city came to a standstill because Christine, one line was shut. That was unplanned for weeks and weeks with no certain ending. The, the difference is that the tube at the moment, what's people's major complaint? It's unreliable. Why? Because the signalling... Overcrowded, signaling, dirty, And the signalling and the maintenance don't work. I've talked to the people who operate it, I've talked to the underground people. The best way to get the work done is to do it quickly. Do you fear the question, Simon who? No. <laughs> I haven't feared it before. I was elected the first time. I've been elected with an increasing majority over the elections ever since. And I tell you, out on the street, out on the street, people know there's a real seconds. choice. And they actually know it's a choice between Ken Livingstone and Simon Hughes. That will be the choice on Thursday. And they know, they know, Christina, that Steve Norris didn't win last time and he won't win this time, and he knows it, and Ken Livingstone knows it, which is why he keeps on trying to talk up the Tory rather than me. Well, you've got chutzpah, that's for sure. That's true, and I will apply it from City Hall as from next Monday week. <laughs> I'm going to come over to this side here, Maxwell Hutchinson. Mr Hughes, demonstrably, you're a supporter of tall buildings in London. You've been a champion of the Shard of Glass over London Bridge Station, designed by Renzo Piano, and that brings a smile to your face, I can see that. What's your long-term policy for high buildings in London? No, Maxwell, you're wrong about that. I supported that building because it's at the other end of London Bridge, it's near the city, it's a right place to have... Are you changing a, your a, mind, no, no, then? No, 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 I supported that building, but I don't have an unequivocal support for high buildings. It's horses for courses, it's suitable buildings in the right places. I'm much less obsessively wedded to them, again, than the outgoing mayor. My view is that in a place like the city, a place like London Bridge, it's right, but in other places it's not. We have a question from Alan Fleming. Your question good, to Mr Hughes. Good evening, Mr Hughes. Alan, good evening. Being a person that's been driving on the streets of London for almost 40 years, and having seen what I now consider to be the fiasco down at Trafalgar Square, which cost £25 million, your proposal to actually pedestrianise Oxford Street is going to cost something in excess of £200 million. Yeah. Now, how are you going to get people to Oxford Street? Because the surrounding streets along there on both sides are going to be so chock-a-block with traffic, nobody's going to get anywhere near it. Simon Hughes. Uh, Alan, I'm going to make a general point and a specific point about Oxford Street. The general point is that I come to all the transport issues with no vested interests, entirely independent, not funded by the unions, not having been paid by a private sector company. So I come as an independent <coughs> voice. I will be an independent mayor, not in anybody's pocket. And therefore, I will talk to anybody about getting the best deal. And I don't believe the mayor always gets it right. You make a proposal. For Oxford Street, the proposal is this. You start on a Sunday. You see how it works. You talk to the businesses. You talk to the users. You talk to the cab drivers. And we'd take the buses to either end. We'd have the cabs being able to cross at each junction. And eventually, if it works, we'd have a tube from one end to the other. I promise you, you'd see London work better. And you'd see things like no traffic lights on red when nothing else is going the other way for 20 minutes, 20 seconds, which is really frustrating. And you'd see things like bus lanes, which weren't there in the middle of the day when there wasn't a single bus using them for minutes at a time. It's practical answers to London's serious transport questions. Let's pick up another couple of questions, and I'm going to come round to this block now, so if you'd like to swing round this way, Simon. Gentleman sitting there at the end in the white jacket. Hi. Since it's been predicted that London seniors may form 30% of what is accepted will be a very low vote, what steps would you take to satisfy <laughs> elderly voters, particularly in regard to those living alone, social isolation in their own homes? You're quite right, 40% of Londoners also live on their own. Uh, the most important thing is that people have accessible transport. That's why the Freedom Pass, not a mayor's responsibility, but inherited from the boroughs, has got to be kept so people can move around. That's why we need to make sure that public transport works really well, not least for disabled people, an issue we were discussing earlier today, because they have the same right and more of them are elderly than of any other age group. And specifically, you have to do other practical things, like allowing carers the ability to move around and park without penalty, and people who drive who are disabled and elderly to have a similar system across the whole of London. A question now from Magdalene Heppel. Hello. Simon, um, I was uh, robbed a little while ago, about five years ago now, and the prints that were left all over my flat 
were roughly this big. I was robbed by children at about three o'clock in the morning. They were so hungry, they made cheese and pickle sandwiches from the food in my fridge. I just wondered what it was that you would suggest would be a good way of using social inclusion to try and gather up children whose, obviously, parents, they're not bothered that they're out turning over people's <clears throat> houses at three in the morning. I just wondered, did you have anything in place? Madeline, the answer is yes. The two jobs I did before I was an MP was as a youth leader, just off the Old Kent, Co Old Kent Road and as a lawyer. You start early, you make sure that's the lesson of the Damalola Taylor case, that you join up what the education service knows in the school with what the social services knows about the family, with what the police knows. You intervene early. You have mentors starting in primary school who have a real interest <coughs> in the kids. I chair a primary school governing body. I know that works. You continue the mentors through the secondary school. You take them into other positive activity. You really develop sport. You offer things after school. But they have to be taught the difference between right and wrong. And there has to be punishment sometimes, and they have to understand that. And if the punishment's in the community, where they can see they're giving back to the community they've harmed, that's often much more effective than putting them out of sight and out of mind. Thank you. Simon Hughes, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Hughes. <laughs> Two down, one to go. We've covered a huge range of subjects already, but don't even dream of going away. After this short break, the current incumbent, Mr Ken Livingstone. Stay with us. <laughs> for the delicious new chicken Caesar Royale from Burger King, topped with crispy bacon, fresh salad, and classic Caesar dressing. Got the urge? Get to Burger King. Every year in the UK, people suffer from food poisoning caused by unseen germs. You're watching how easily these germs spread. You can stop these germs spreading by simply washing your hands and kitchen utensils. Keep your kitchen safe. For more information, visit our website. Discover the Magnum Naughty Bit of Truffle and experience intensity like never before. New Magnum Intense from Walls. Land, you can afford to go a little further with the barbecue this summer. If you don't want to sneeze and you don't want to wallow. One a day Zyrtec. It's hay fever hard. Zyrtec controls your hay fever blue. It's the light and, and the space and the colors. And the amazing energy that it has. 
It's positive, it's vibrant, it's alive. It's hard to capture in words. I think it's brilliant. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, our third and final candidate, the present mayor, Ken Livingstone. <laughs> Four years ago, he became London's first elected mayor. He introduced the most audacious <coughs> traffic control scheme in the world, recruited 5,000 more police officers and plans for a total of 35,000. If he gets elected for a second term, he says he'll keep improving bus and tube services and build 15,000 low-cost, affordable homes. Nick Ferrari, your three minutes with Ken Livingstone. Start now. Mr Livingstone, good evening. Hi. You sit here with uh, four years as mayor of this great mm. capital under your belt on the very week that we hear that there could be more industrial chaos on the underground. You're not in control, are you? Well, you can't order people to work. Now, we're moving from a situation where, for over a decade, where there's a virtual civil war between the underground managers and the union. I've brought in new managers. It's taking time to get the trade union to actually get into a better working relationship with them. We're in the middle of negotiating a three-year wages well, and conditions the package. They're, they're calling for industrial action, yeah, and, and, I mean, as is often the case in uh, a, a long, intense period of negotiation. What, for industrial Whether that strike, will happen, that, that's the, whether that will case. happen or not, will depend. I've asked the underground bosses to go and meet the trade union um, today. Um, over the next 24 hours, and I suspect we'll be able to actually proceed towards getting the three-year pay deal and we will not have a strike. Will the tubes be running on election day? Well, I will do everything I can to ensure that they are. <laughs> Why is it necessary to pay the boss of the tube, Bob Kiley, half a million pounds a year? Well, <laughs> Bob, Bob Kiley isn't paid half a million pounds. I think you'll find he is. He also has use of a two million, two yeah. million pound house he's in London. Half he's paid half what the boss of rail track gets. It's, and uh, I that's have to say, I think we're doing a lot better when million. we actually look. The transformation of the buses, the successful introduction of the congestion charge, and now I do think we're beginning to see the start of progress on the underground. You have plans to roll out congestion charging. Mm. Why? I think it's worked as well as well, could be expected. There are always going to be losers. We never said everyone would win with this. Huge improvements to air quality, dramatic improvement in terms of the ability to get around in central London. There is still fairly extensive congestion in that area to the west of the zone. And I think, providing we can get a public consensus around that, um, we should proceed to extend it. You spend more... Between tra your offices at Transport for London and, uh, and uh, City Hall, you spend more on press offices than the Prime Minister. Why? Hey. You're taking... The Prime Minister, you're not including the press offices, the, the Defence Department, the Environment Department. He has the whole country to run, Mr Mayor. You I've got one, one press office and it's got 12 staff in it. They spend all their day asking, answering questions from your staff and newspaper staff and so on. And if we weren't answering the questions, you'd say we were having a cover-up. You think it's money well spent? I mean, it's, it's a quite small press office for a nine million pound One and a half million pound pounds. Pound 30 seconds, gentlemen. Uh, last, time round, Mr. last time round, Mr Livingstone, you promised that you would bring conductors back on the mm. buses. You did not. Why should we believe you this time? I, I would like to bring conductors back on the buses. Well, you're the mayor. You can but, do it. Well, no, on, well, only I get the money from the government to actually do it. The government weren't prepared to give me the money to put conductors. We had an experiment. It didn't improve the speed of the buses sufficiently to justify rolling out. So what we're doing instead, but you did we've recruited a thousand police to police the buses. They do nothing but the but police they don't the take the fares, Mr. Livingston. I have to stop it there, gentlemen. Thank you both very much indeed. Mm. Eve Pollard, your three minutes with Ken Livingston start now. Mr. Livingston, good evening. Aye. You've actually managed to um, raise another four thousand policemen in the last mm. four years. But violent crime is up. What do you hope to do in the next four years to bring it down? Well, I mean, violent crime was soaring when I got in. The police morale was down. Police numbers are down. You don't turn that round overnight. We've got the extra police officers. Two thirds of them have gone into the outer London boroughs, not concentrated in the centre. Unfortunately, we've had to use a thousand on anti terrorism work. We need another 5,000. 
what you've seen this year is the rollout to the policing that I think Londoners want, neighbourhood police, six in each ward, in each neighbourhood, and it's my intention to roll that out until every neighbourhood in London has got it. Already the figures coming back are very encouraging. Crime is being cut quite substantially because the police presence deters. <laughs> But last April there were 20, there were 14 murders. Mm. This April there were 21. I mean, violent crime is going up. I mean, car crime is mm. down, but then who wants a car if there's congestion charge? Mm. Um, <laughs> well, but, um, I mean, if, if you actually look at the crime figures, crime figure, I mean, you're less likely to now to be the victim of burglary than any time for 27 <laughs> years. Street crime has been cut by 20% and um, nearer 25% over the last two years. It continued to rise because I inherited a declining force. We've now got it under control, it's coming down. There is a problem that, I mean, the figures now are much better in reporting domestic violence and hate crimes and anti-Semitic crimes than they were before, because we've put real effort into that. And it might be a while before we actually get what really are the accurate figures. I mean, four or five years ago, women didn't bother to report domestic violence because it wasn't taken seriously. Now it is. But that's the government is changing the law. I mean, I, as a woman, I feel frightened if I... I mean, there are lots of places that are not well lit. There are lots of places in London that are very scary for women. What are you going to do about that? Well, I mean, look, look at the record. For 40 years, people said, we want to see police on the streets. No politician delivered it. They were in the cars. I'm the first politician anywhere in this country to get them out the cars and onto the streets. We've been prepared to drive that policy through. The police establishment didn't agree with it. They are now appearing on the streets. Everyone recognises the success. And it is going to be the single most important thing to carry on for the next four years so everybody gets the reassurance of knowing. When you get off the bus or tube for that last mile home at night, you might pop in, um, bump into a police officer and that's the reassurance you want. Well, I, I haven't seen him lately, but... 30 seconds. Let me just ask you one thing. From last October to this October, 2002 to 2003, you spent £19 million on advertising. Mm. That's more than Boots, that's mm. more than Lloyd's, TSB. Yeah, but, that's, we, it's a we are, fortune. We are a big business. We are the, um, the major transport provider in London. You advertise the ticket concessions. We've had the huge rollout of the Oyster Car, which has been an incredible success. We've spent a lot of money getting tourists into this city. On New Year's Eve, it was full occupancy in our hotels. We there advertised I have to, to stop do it. it. Eve, thank you very much indeed. We'll take some thank questions you. now from the audience to the Mayor. And first of all, Mike Rutherford. I'm uh, glad you admitted you're a big business. That's exactly what you are when you're taking in the congestion tax mm. rather than the congestion charge, as you call it. Mm. But I really want to ask you why it is that you think that uh, people who drive a certain type of car, a four-wheel drive vehicle, for example, who happen to go near the school gates, maybe to drop off their child before going off to work, maybe it's a woman that's dropping off several ch children mm. in a five-, seven-seater people carrier that actually doesn't take up any more, sp uh, more space than a taxi. Why that woman, or anybody come to that, is considered not by you just to be an idiot, but a complete idiot? Oh, well, I mean, you actually look at the situation in this city. It is a congested city. What is the justification for having a four-wheel drive? We're not going over rough terrain here. Now, that's my opinion. You're free. You are completely free to have ten four-wheel drives if you want, and I'm completely free to have my opinion that you're a complete idiot. <laughs> okay, we'll Women dropping off their kids at school are idiots. Uh, yeah. No, no, you can Correct. drop your kids at school in a reasonable sized car. Well, like a Why taxi, do you same need size. a four wheel drive in London? Bob Oddie. Ken, the, the London taxi trade broadly supports congestion mm. charging, but we're now very concerned about your low emission zones. Mm. And whilst we do appreciate you have a statutory duty to improve air quality in London, can you reassure the taxi trade? that the cost of those improvements will not be borne by taxi drivers and taxi passengers? Well, I mean, I mean the congestion charge has helped pollution in the centre for the suburbs. What the low emission zone will do is from 2007, buses, coaches, taxis, any large vehicle coming in, if it's polluting, it's illegal. And what we'll gi we're giving, I mean, three years' notice here, that firms have to get modern, clean vehicles and stop that pollution. The cab trade is different. You're, you're not big business. And what we've said is we don't think that should be an individual burden on the cabbie. We'll work with the Energy Saving Trust and government to actually make certain that we actually provide the financial support. Because it's only some cabs, anyhow. A lot of cabs are, are now, I mean, fine. It's some of the older ones. But it will not be a burden on the individual cabbie. That wouldn't be fair. Michelle Forbes. Where's Michelle Forbes? Yes. Michelle, your question. Ken, I lost my son. He was murdered, mm. shot, 
yards from my home on the 7th of December 2003. Surprisingly, not in a hot spot, in leafy Clapham. Mm. Um, I've talked to his friends. His friends are absolutely frightened, as are a lot of young men now, because the gun crime has risen, and it's risen rapidly. Um, I understand that you want to put more police on the streets, and more police visibility is always great. However, I'm not convinced that that will stop the rise in the gun crime, particularly given when, you know, police are getting shot and drive-by shootings. In my son's case, the car that was seen at the scene shot at police less mm. than three weeks later. So they're not frightened of police. They don't have any, uh, you know, respect for authority mm. boundaries. I want to know, what are you going to do about the serious rise in our boroughs of gun crime? And how are you going to do it? There is a real problem with guns getting in circulation. And although I know it's a civil liberties issues for some, my strongly been urging the government to ban all replica guns because it's only an hour's work to turn a replica gun into one that can fire and kill. I also think, and this is now where I think the government needs to do more, I mean, you come into this country and customs... I mean, if you've ever been to Australia, virtually everybody has their luggage searched. I think we need to have more customs officers because there is a constant flow of guns in from Eastern Europe and other places that we need to actually intercept. So I would actually say ban all replica guns, have much more aggressive um, searching of luggage and vehicles coming into this country, not just for the guns, but for the drugs as well. OK, I'll take one more question. Adele Darwish, and then I'll take a couple from the audience generally. Mm. Adele Darwish, where are you? I'm here. White coat there, sir. Mm. Uh, where I live, in South End Green, there's all the six or seven buses mm. standing there idle while the driver's having tea breaks. You keep throwing buses on the roads to add more to congestion. What we need is bus journeys, not bus numbers. We need to employ more bus drivers. And why should we believe you when you lied about bus conductors if you're going to throw some statistics to get me now? Oh, well, the truth is, the day I was elected, there were four and a quarter million journeys a day on the bus. Today, there's six million. There's a thousand well, extra buses there on either. the roads. Six and it is the biggest them. expansion of bus ridership anywhere in the world. This is the only city in the world which has seen people shift from their car to their buses. The and I have to say to break. you, you may not like bus drivers, but I'll tell you this, no, after they've driven have another across bus London, driver waiting they've got a right to, to have out. a tea break and have a cup of tea before they drive back across Why London. Why is there another driver waiting for him to take the bus out? Well, that's fine. I mean, Where is it? Employ more bus drivers. On a shift. Any man, sir? They may be changing on a shift, but the truth is the biggest single success in public transport in this country in the last 30 years is the way we've constructed the buses in this city. We're now running as many bus miles and carrying as many passengers as four decades ago. The woman in the second row in the pink jacket there. Um, Mr Livingstone, I come from Bromley, a place you may recognise, although most of us think you don't know where we are. What have you actually done for the suburbs? You've doubled the precept on our council tax, you've sucked police out of Bromley, and I can tell you, you can't find one in Bromley when there's a big event in London, like a Lo London football match, and you have interfered in local decisions which should properly be taken by local elected councillors well, in respect of issues that do not affect the rest of London. Well, can I... The, the biggest thing I've done for Bromley, when the leader of Bromley Council came to see me and effectively said, we haven't got the money to continue to run Crystal Palace and to rebuild oh, the sports stadium... Irrelevant. I that took that off irrelevant. him, and that has been a real assistance to the borough of Bromley. Also, as no. I said earlier... Two-thirds of the extra policing have gone into the boroughs. I've made absolutely clear in my guidance to the police commissioner that these neighbourhood patrols, every borough got the same number. It's not just going to be in a we few boroughs at the centre. Every borough's had them. And if you look at the transport spending, 80% of the transport budget has gone into outer London. We don't you are have totally any dependent tubes. on the bus service, which has been upgraded. Three quarters of all the buses have been replaced in Bromley. We've got new routes, we've got nice bu night bus routes, and the only reason there's an improvement in the quality of life in Bromley is because we're starting to get that shift of people out their car and onto a decent public transport system. And that system demonstrates again. how okay, little you know about I want to bring I want to bring another question in the woman who's sitting right at the very end there in the dark coat your question to the mayor Ken um, you've done lots of good things but how can you possibly support a six-lane road bridge in East London which 
nearly 50% of people, local people, don't have a car in that area, and you didn't even ask them different options that they may want to consider um, for, for transport access in, the, in that area. And independent experts say that it will do little or nothing for local unemployment well, and basically bring more listen. pollution and congestion to some of the poorest well, parts of London. we did listen to them, and if you actually check on both sides of the River Thames in the East End, 85% of people want that bridge because they look in central London and west London. In Richmond, you've got they four bridges across choice. the Thames. We're offering four boroughs in east London where there is high unemployment, a lot of deprivation, the chance to be able to get to the new jobs that are coming into the Thames Gateway. It is a bus... Do you really think that when we put a quarter of a million new people in the homes we're going to build in the Thames Gateway, that they shouldn't have the same right to be able to cross the River Thames as the people who live in Chelsea or the people who live in they Richmond. They want access. And on that point, I'm going to stop it. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Mr Livingstone. Thank you very much, Liv. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, now, as, uh, as you all know, in fact, there are ten candidates in, uh, in this election and we have invited two others to join our audience tonight and I'm going to invite each of them just to uh, ask one question of the three candidates. And first of all, for the Green Party, Darren Johnson. Darren Johnson, your brief question to the three candidates sitting here. Well, I would like to ask, uh, who is serious about scrapping road building in this city and putting the money into public transport and into facilities for cyclists and pedestrians where it's needed, rather than just into more roads, which will just create more traffic and more pollution? Thank you, Darren Johnson. Mr Norris. <laughs> well, I think um, Darren knows, uh, slightly surprisingly for some, that road building is simply not on my agenda in the short term. I agree entirely with the idea of this ludicrous bridge, which is an environmental disaster across the Thames and which sucks in hundreds of millions of pounds. There are an awful lot of schemes here which are a complete waste of money. We've got a desperately underfunded public transport system. We're doing pathetically little for walking and cycling in this city. It's perfectly obvious that the priorities at the moment are all wrong. The important thing for us is to make sure we spend the money we've got to the full and as unlike this man, I go and talk to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who controls the government budget, which this man officially has never done in four years, and go and That's talk to him. No, never in four years. Never in four years. Officially. Never in four... Yeah. No, officially. never. Officially. officially. Never officially in four years. He's met him secretly behind the park bench <laughs> late at night. You didn't persuade Gordon Brown to set £40 a week for every person getting back into employment after unemployment solely for Londoners without a very good dialogue between myself and the Chancellor, my office and the Chancellor. There are two areas of London where we have appalling gridlock and terrible environmental problems caused by traffic totally piled up. One is at Bounds Green, one is at the Thames Road down in Bexley. And it is nonsense to pretend this is some massive new road building programme. The bridge and those two. Out of a, a £25 billion request for government for investment in transport, that's the only things we're doing on roads. The rest is all going into new trains, new um, tube lines and new buses. OK, and we're also at this stage going to invite Ram Gudamal from the People's Christian Alliance for a comment on what you have heard so far. Sure. The rich-poor divide is a scandal. It has got worse over the last four years, over the last ten years. Something specific needs to be done. Even though I didn't become mayor, ideas in my manifesto from 2000 I put into practice on a pilot scale. I believe a lot more can be done. The mayor may say there is no power, but there's a heck of a lot of influence, and this agenda of the rich-poor divide does need to register on the radar screen of whoever runs the city, and I do look forward to run it because I'm in it to win it. Thank Ram, you. Thank you very much indeed. Very much. <laughs> See, James Morris? Uh, uh, hang on, just to, I must do it this way, Simon. James Morris. We've been um, trying to understand why several million voters won't bother to go to the polls on June the 10th, and my question to the candidates is, what is the one thing they could say to all those millions of people who probably aren't going to vote on June the 10th is why this London election is crucial and why they should go to the poll. Simon Hughes. Because I'm not Mr Blair's mayor and therefore will stand up to the government and I'll be the only person out of these three whose hand has been in nobody's pocket, who hasn't been paid from one side of the argument to the other and who on a day like today, when we're threatened with going on strike in London in a week's time, can go to both sides and say, I'm independent, I'll put Londoners first. And I don't care if you vote for Simon 
or you vote for Steve, or you vote for Ram, or you vote for Darren. Turn out and vote, because as the vote goes up, the more difficult it is for extremist and racist parties to get in. We fought for this. Women fought for this very recently. This right to vote. And we, all of us, have got a responsibility to make sure that on June the 10th, more than four out of ten Londoners, which is what it's looking like at the moment, actually get off their backsides okay. and go put a vote in a ballot box. Doesn't matter who it is, just make sure you do it. The debate continues with a phone-in on LBC 97.3 FM at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. My thanks to all of you who made it here to the studio this evening, and even more so to those of you who are good enough to watch at home. The vote counts. Use it. A very good night to all of you. <laughs>